And so welcome, friends. Stephen Feder is my name. I manage the United in Learning program for the General Counsel Office. And it is a, a pleasure and a delight to welcome you here tonight and to welcome David Sparks with us too. And to have this chance to talk together about David's prayers and about prayer in general and why we do it and what it's for and, and uh, uh, why we need books of prayers. And uh, I was, I've had such fun kind of having wide ranging conversations with David about uh, why, we, why we do this and, and uh, why it matters. And so I want to invite you to participate in that kind of conversation as we go through it tonight. David and I have worked through a, 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 an outline that will give you a chance to sample bits of his, his newest book and uh, uh, give us some different things to talk about as we move along. But we're also really interested to know where you're at with this and how you're feeling and what you're looking for and what you're noticing as we go along. So, so in the process of this, we're going to we're going to use some of David's prayers as an opportunity to to gather ourselves and focus ourselves. But we'll also invite you when we've done that to ref reflect on what we've seen and what we've noticed and and uh, what jumped out at us in the in the prayers that uh, that David has written, and we'll use that as a as a spark for the conversation that we have as we go along. So I'm kind of excited to be able to get together <laughs> a whole group of prayers and not just to confine this conversation to the two of us. Uh, yeah, me too. There are, because there are so, <laughs> so many of us though, we're gonna ask you to leave your mics muted and to interact with us on the chat. So the chat will be your tool to, to, to communicate with us. And my job here is to read the chat you can read it too if you want. It's public. But if it's too complicated to read the chat and listen to what David has to say, he's more important. Pay, pay attention to his, uh, his his comments, and I will I will follow the chat and uh, uh, walk and chew gum at the same time and make sure that your comments don't get forgotten. And if I miss one, um, and it's important, put it in again because it meant that I was paying attention to what he had to say instead of reading too. It's, uh, I, I really am only human, but it, it is a, a pleasure and a delight to be able to, to connect this way. It's our practice in, uh, in these kinds of gatherings, not simply to jump into the content, but also first to acknowledge the territory where we gather and from which we gather. And because we're not all in one place, we are acknowledging territories all across the country. And so take a moment, take a moment to write into the chat some words about the, the people who have cared for the land where you are sitting long before your ancestors came here. Think about the land that cared for them. Think about the ways that people have nurtured and been nourished by the land you're sitting on. Think about the treaties that bind us and connect us, even when we fail to live up to them. Name those in the chat. We'll just take a moment to watch as they come through. I'm not going to read them all aloud because inevitably I stumble over the names. But I'll leave you in silence to read them as they come. I will acknowledge the Mississaugas of the New Credit. And in a dish with one spoon wampum belt covenant. that connects people all around the Great Lakes Basin. And I'll acknowledge the Silk Okanagan peoples here. Uh, 
I have this candle that lives just behind my desk, which I light when I gather with my congregation members in prayer. And I'm going to light it again tonight as an acknowledgement that we are here not simply to talk about something interesting, although I hope you find it interesting, but we are here to engage in something holy and to celebrate the light that is such a powerful symbol in this season of Advent and the divine spark that gathers us all from wherever we sit. We're going to open this with one of the prayers from, from David's book. David, tell us just a little bit about this prayer. Where did it come from? And, uh, uh, and so on before we, before we pray it together. This is the Disciples for Today. It, it came from a reflection on, on uh, Jesus calling the, the team, the disciple team, and thinking about what, what is the team of disciples about today? What might they be about? That's basically it. So as we gather, we're all team members. David's going to be the leader. He's going to read the parts that are in ordinary type. We together, including me, will read the parts that are in boldface type. And unfortunately, we can't turn our mics on because we can't stay in sync with each other. You will remember that from Zoom services all the way through the pandemic. But I trust that, that you will be here speaking the words with me and we together will be the, the team that David talks about. So here's a prayer from, from David's book, from page 31. The screens are ready for our work to contact, to explain, to research, to simply keep in touch. As disciples, we will use our screens carefully. The downhearted are ready for our work to affirm, to support, to meet them where they are. As disciples, we will be with the downhearted compassionately. The powerful mm -hmm. will encounter us as we work to face them, to speak out, to act justly. As disciples, we will counter the powerful courageously. All people will be our friends as we work with patience, with humor, and with determination to include everyone. As disciples, we will show the world that everyone is of value. We bring understanding, patience, and a willingness to go to work. As disciples, we will rejoice as we feel we are included. Disciples of Jesus, trying, searching, sometimes reaching, sometimes failing but never reluctant to pursue the way of faith. Amen. Amen. <laughs> well, thank you for that, David. What a, what a lovely way to begin. Friends, let me invite you to use the chat and think about what we've just said together. What did you notice? What did you notice about this as a prayer? As a prayer, is it the kind of prayer you might want to use in a worship service you're leading or in a uh, UCW meeting that you're presiding over? Does this sound like the prayers you're used to praying? What, what, what jumps out at you in this prayer? I'm going to read the comments aloud because they otherwise they don't end up in the recording. Laura says, this would be wonderful to open a Kairos meeting. 
more relevant to our work than most. Pacing power with courage, says Eileen. I'd love to use this prayer, says Linda, in our visioning session this week. The focus on us as disciples, right where we find ourselves, calling friends, all included. I'd use it as a call to worship, says Susan. Which is essentially what we did tonight, right? Right. One of the things I found I really enjoyed about your book, David, and, and other people won't know this because you probably haven't seen it yet. David has written prayers by my moving through the Gospel of Mark from, from the chapter 1, verse 1, right through the, the, the very end in chapter 16. And and sixteen verse eight. <laughs> I was going to say verse eight. I was I was I was not going to say verse nine or ten. You left those out appropriately. So, um, but but that you know there he goes through every chapter of the book of Mark, and there are prayers for every pericope that that grow out of his personal reflection on this. And so this one comes out of gosh, what chapter was that? I should I should have known that. Um, Three, I think. Yes, chapter three. But beside the the prayers, he's then got a study guide that you could use in uh, um, in a Bible study for uh, for uh, for the Gospel of Mark. And the first question I wanted to ask you, David, was about why Mark. I mean, I know it's the shortest one. Maybe it meant the book was got, got finished <laughs> faster. But surely there's a better reason than that. Why did you choose Mark? Yeah, I, I think there were three three good reasons. Um, the first one is a personal um, a personal reason. Uh, when I was wondering about a change in my own life from office management to Christian ministry, I, as part of thinking about it, I read I read the sixteen chapters of Mark from start to finish. And and it was very significant in my making a, a major life decision, um, no no doubt about it. So that that was one. Mark is is a compelling gospel. It's saying to its readers, the work the world is a tough place, often violent, often conflicted, grossly unfair. But you aspiring follow, followers of Jesus, if you choose to be, will be courageous enough to bring the challenge to its leaders and its power persons in your small corner of the world and way beyond. Mm. So for me, it started with a personal thing and went on as I, I, I studied more in it. And the second thing about Mark is that um without any doubt at all it centers the purpose of jesus in bringing the kingdom the rule of god to be mm. and it there's no sense of just glorifying jesus christ it's it's really all about the kingdom and Mona hooker who who's done a wonderful commentary on mark says that his every action is characterized by authority. And in Jesus, Mark's readers, the ones that take a look at it in the first century, are confronted by the rule of God in action, and they have to decide, and it's a big decision. It's for or against him. So you, there's no two ways about it in the first century, and probably because the Christian church was being persecuted in the first century, it was a very, very tough, tough, tough decision. And and interestingly, um, in the gospel, you have an account of the disciples of Jesus, and they get a bit of a negative press. Oh, God, they, they never do anything right. <laughs> well, exactly. Uh, 
Uh, I mean, sometimes they're arguing amongst themselves. Sometimes they're not understanding Jesus. One of them betrayed him. And at the end of things, when he really needed some support, they they weren't there. And and I think, and and uh, Mona Hooker thinks that, that this is quite deliberate. The, the disciples are given a bad press to say, look, even those closest to Jesus had it, had it really tough. You're going to have it tough, but you can get through. You can do it. You can make the decision for the kingdom. So that's the, um, that's the second reason. And the third reason is that another good commentator on Mark um, um, oh, his name has gone from me just just David Rhodes that's right who who wrote the book about the story of Mark he he said that it's a really appropriate gospel for today it's on an individual level it's characterized by healing and forgiveness a willingness to serve others and to take risks as you serve and a refusal to let money, power, status define your life for you. And, but it's more than that. It, it's, a, it's a gospel that speaks um, to community, to, for a community to be compassionate with the weak, allowing there to be compassion for outcasts and opposing oppression. It, it has a sort of community side to it. So those are the three reasons, my own experience. Um, Mona Hooker and her commentary say you have to take a big decision and David wrote saying, look, as an individual, as, as a community, you can learn a whole lot from Mark. But, and this is the really interesting thing that David Rhodes says, if you do this, if you truly enter into dialogue with Mark, it's magic will go to work on you and bring change and i found that moving and exciting all at once well and you really invite us into a dialogue with mark i mean i've read i've got a lot on the bookshelf over there i've got lots of books of prayers i haven't seen a book before that followed along a gospel the way yours does and that also includes a study guide on the gospel like I have three screens on this computer and I had the prayer and I had the study guide and I had the, the Bible gateway on, on all three screens so that I could see what you were talking about in the intersection between the, 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 the book and the, the, the prayer and the, the, the study guide. Why did you do it that way? What, what, what was your hope? when you were kind of adding a study guide into a book of prayers? Oh, my hope was that uh, that people, especially new to the church or new to the gospels would, uh, would, would be, would use it in groups. And, and, and my hope would be that uh, individual churches would see that there's a real possibility here. It's not your average heavy Bible study. It's, light and it has the basics it it has um questions it has um it has it has questions it has um um a way of getting at at the questions and it, it has prayer mm -hmm. and of course you you just link it in with the uh, the gospel that 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 you want to use, and you can use as many sections in an evening or an afternoon as you want. It, it's a study. It's a, it's a very um, simple, basic study guide 
for those that don't know the the gospel very well um and and of course if you have a a leader that does know the gospel well then they can add add worth to it just for me the notion that prayer and study are not two separate things but that they're the same they're the same that one grows out of the other was really um evocative and and hopeful there's a kind of urgency to mark too i mean the stories are short and they all tumble over each other and sometimes they interrupt each other and it's just uh it's it's a very urgent kind of gospel i think yeah it is it's it's the uh, the Greek word ethios, I think, is, you know, Jesus did that, and then he went somewhere else, and then he did something else, and then he did something else. That there is an immediacy, a, a, an impatience almost about Mark, I think, in the way it's written. And I think that's good. That, that comes through. The other thing that <laughs> jumped out at me in that prayer that we just prayed together I don't know if I've ever seen a prayer that talked about screens before. <laughs> That's kind I of a crunchy it. language, don't you think? That's <laughs> kind of cool. Well, it sort of brings it into today because everybody's got them and everybody's using them. <laughs> yeah. There's a there's a voice in your prayers that is ordinary language and sort of everyday concerns that I was really appreciating. It, this isn't a stained glass voice. It's a it's a it, it's a it's a, a language of, of every day. That was kind of cool. No, and I've tried to get away from that actually, Steve. Um I I really have very little time for that. I don't think that communicates well. We we may talk about that a little later on, but um, I think today's language is what we strive for in prayer. So let's back up for a minute. What is prayer? What, what are we doing when we pray? What's it for? Well, that's a really good. That's a really good question. <laughs> um, Maybe we'll start with what it's not for. <laughs> mm -hmm. Okay. Is that, is, that, is that escaping, getting getting out of it? Uh, what it's not for is not getting God to do what we can do for ourselves. Mm. Um, pastoral prayers, I think, in this, in this uh, situation, often try and do that. Uh, we try to, um, to pray for... Um, for um we, we tried we tried to pray for god to get to uh, to um to to change from um oh, it's the words that i've just gone from me for a minute um we often ask um, god to fix things for us right we ask god to yes, come well, and stop the fighting in the middle east or yeah or, yeah or, or the or all the climate change that that's what i was trying to mm, remember okay. yeah um i i got a, a a real lead in on this from a book by neville ward the use of praying he put it this way he didn't quite put it this way i modified it a little but here here, here goes uh prayers are pieces of work involving action mm. going out of the way to do the work god needs done even if it costs us mm. prayers are pieces of work involving action and i i really like that and effective prayer challenges the prayer the one who offers as well as those who, uh, who participate and uh, a good way of looking at this is um Think of a, a bicycle with two seats, a tandem bike. Mm -hmm. um, there's that sort of prayer, the getting God to do what you like, 
what you want is is a prayer where um god is sitting on the back seat and and pedaling fev feverishly while we're sitting in the front with our our legs up on the uh, handlebars mm -hmm. whereas um i think a more faithful image would be of the same bike the same position god at the back and us in the front but us pedaling with god coaching helping mm -hmm. dreaming aspiring for us uh, that makes sense to me anyway I don't know if I'm ever entirely sure what I think God does. I have a pretty strong sense of how prayer changes me. What What do you think about that? How does prayer change you? Why do you do it? What does it do for you? I think for me, prayer is a... Well, let's give an example again. I, I know when, when I was in regular ministry before i uh, if i had to see a, a grieving family or had to arrange a funeral i would always work, stop outside the house just take a minute or two hmm. just be quiet let things go for a while and then go into the into the home and and get on with what had to be done. Mm. But I needed that break. I needed that time to reorganize my thinking, to to stop and then relax and then go forward. So that, that certainly was one of the ways that prayer worked for me, works for me when I do it, which is not so often. Mm. Um, but I think um, more than that, I mean, I think when I'm writing prayers, I have a little pattern as well. I I start off by uh, trying to get out of doing it. I, I do almost <laughs> anything to stop, <laughs> to avoid having to write. <laughs> and, uh, and then, you know, I, I go through my excuses, get water, get a snack, think of something else but eventually get down to it. And then I read through the passage, read through two or three times and just leave it. And then if I have time and there's nobody around, I'll read it out loud, read the passage out loud, and then I'll get on with writing the prayer. And I, I find often that that works for me that sort of pattern of um, reading the Bible, being quiet, and then waiting for something to happen, some thoughts to come, and often they do. And, and of course, they're, they, this always happens just before a meal or um, just before I'm going out. <laughs> I have to get on with writing and, and pay a price for it, yeah. See, I, so that's a couple I would, of things anyway. I, I would say that's praying. I wouldn't say that's just writing. I would say that's deliberately trying to create space for connection with the spirit. And and I mean, there's all sorts of different kinds of prayer, right? I mean, I, I don't very, do very well at sort of sitting there with a single word either, but I think that is prayer, isn't it? Oh, sure. I mean, I wouldn't dispute that, you know, and and I mean, it's not just that. I mean, um, it's a very natural thing to offer thanks to God for an unexpected gift or an unexpected visitor or a change in health or or, or something that that touches us deeply. And it's also perfectly natural to offer to God our deepest concerns, our, our fondest dreams, our words of compassion. That's 
that's that's probably all prayer as well. Mm -hmm. So I don't tend to put the word prayer around it. Hmm. I I certainly offer my deepest feelings to God, but I I often do it quite without thinking and without going into the prayer mode, you know. Mm -hmm. I often find I want to turn over a problem I'm wrestling with in the presence of God or in the context of scripture, or I want to remember what I say I believe and make my decisions in the light of that. So that, you know, I, I don't want to just do the expedient thing i want to do the faithful thing and it takes me time and focus to discern that maybe now maybe that's why i light the candle because i want to remember that i'm doing this not just on my own strength but in well, one of the interesting the to be there too i mean does that ring bells for you is that, is that yeah sure it does talking about yeah uh, i mean one of the interesting things is that we know very little about um, the praying pattern of Jesus in Mark. There are only three, three times that he he's noted as praying. One is one is um, when he uh, gets up early in the morning and goes out to pray. You can imagine. Mm -hmm. what, well, why did he do that? Well, he probably wanted to get away from the disciples for a while and just the crowds and just be on his own. To, sure. Like do all the things that you were saying. Um, and the, set, the other time is just before the transfiguration when he goes to the bottom of the mountain and, and prays again, gets away, not with his... Jesus doesn't have a praying buddy. He, he sort of does it on his own, as far yeah. as I see it anyway. And then we see him later on... Um, uh, just before he's arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he is quite distraught, grief-stricken, beside himself with concern. Um, and I, I think um, probably that's because he uh, um, he realized that there was a possibility that he would not be arrested, that that the people would would turn and and go with him mm. not just away from him and that things would work out and so he's beginning to realize it's just not going to happen not going to happen yeah i think anyway i, I mean I, certainly in that example we don't know what he said because they were all asleep any words that we, we that they tell us, they're imagining he must have said something like this, but they didn't hear it. They were asleep. Well, I, I think probably, um, yeah, probably um, it, it was um, a situation where he could have got out of it. Anyway, I he didn't. <laughs> I, um, you know what, I think we are living in a time when we can ask these important questions about what is prayer for and we don't have to give the the uh, polished doctrinal answers that our grandparents would have had to parrot we can be a whole lot more questioning and tentative and maybe honest in our answers so thank you and it, privilege to talk with you about these things i'd like to pause and and look at another prayer uh, and then move the conversation in a slightly different direction so as we as we just take a breather here um the next one is one that i know you asked for um but i can hardly wait for you to tell us why this is called the time to get angry where does this come from and why did you want us to read it tonight together well, I, I don't know where it comes from, really. Um, it, it's one that, it's it's the thought, again, it's the thought of the more human Jesus, the same one that really didn't want to be crucified, um, that the Jesus that 
that people don't talk about very often, the angry Jesus overturning the tables of the money changers. And it's it's not what you expect. And and I thought, yeah, it is sometimes time to get angry. And and that's where the prayer came from. Mm -hmm. Let me put it up on the screen. And I again I will invite people to pray with us. Where are we here? Make sure I get the right one. There it is. Lead us through it, David, if you please. Is it time to get angry, loving God? When we see many without adequate mental health care? Is it time to get angry? When we're told that millions worldwide are going without needed vaccinations? Is it time to get angry? When warm and clean housing is not available for many families? Is it time to get angry? When discrimination because of sexual orientation is allowed. Is it time to get angry? When women are denied opportunities available to men. Is it time to get angry? When those with different abilities and talents are overlooked and excluded. Yes, it is time. We will not turn away. We will not make excuses. We will not leave the job to someone else. We have the example of Jesus to follow. We will get angry. We will get busy. Amen. Amen. So, folks online, you've been very silent. It's your turn. What did you notice in that one? Very different kind of prayer than the first one we read. What uh, what struck you in that as, as we read that together? The trouble with asking a question is that immediately people start typing, but we don't see what they say until they push enter. <laughs> <laughs> Susan likes the honesty of it. Yeah. And the passion, eh? Timely issues. It's okay to be angry, says Carrie. Cuts to the chase, says Verna. Relatable to the world today. The challenge, says Laura, it makes people uneasy. Uh, yeah, and that's a place for that, isn't it? Being uneasy. <laughs> Worship is not always comfortable the the other thing is um one thing in the um one thing in the the prayer that that last prayer about anger the, the repetition of the phrase you know about anger i i was going to I, mention that i think I, I, rhetorically i loved that I'll just put it back up so people can see it. What I love yeah. about what you did in this one is that you had the the crunchy words said by the congregation. And the leader just keeps inviting the same phrase over and over. Is it time to get angry? The, the repetition is there, but the leader is the one who's inviting and the congregation are the ones who are naming the issues. And, and, and then that, that long section at the end where the congregation expresses commitment. Like, it's always a little scary and humbling to put words like that into a congregation's mouth, but those are powerful words to read. Holy cow. Um, I, th I think, it, you know, as, as a writer of prayers, to use um, words time and time again there's a place for that and as there is a place for using single words as in in the leadership role and i i think that's one for people to take away um the, a sort of um simile for that is music you know where you use a single note or a single phrase and repeat it time and time again and in the repetition, there is 
understanding, there is enjoyment, there is challenge, and so so on. Mm-hmm. I, th- I think repetition is is something in that particular prayer, and and it's a value to anybody who who is about writing prayers. It doesn't matter that it's repeated. <laughs> oh, if anything, it it strengthens the message, right? You repeat the stuff that's important. It's like the Genesis 1 story, and it was good, over and over and over again. I mean, the central message of that creation story in Genesis 1 is that the world is good. There's there's people in the in the chat who are um, responding to the notion that Jesus got angry uh, in positive ways, not negative ones, but acknowledging that that's, that's something we wrestle with. But uh, do, you want, do you want to kind of expand on your thoughts on that a bit? No, I don't think so. <laughs> That's fair. It is a challenging concept, Joyce, Jesus being angry. We've grown up with a Sunday school picture of Jesus as the meek and mild, gentle Jesus who never raised his finger and who only ever talked about a kind of sentimental love. This is a very crunchy love. A love with hard edges sometimes. Right. So what do you think makes prayer relevant and compelling, David? What do you aim for when you're writing a prayer that you want to really resonate with people? I I think it it the secret is is um getting into the the world of, of your congregation your your audience the people that are on the receiving end of your prayer knowing what's going on for them hmm. what's happening for them and then expressing the prayer in words that are simple enough that they will be understood and, and these these are not complicated words long words these are usually short words um give you a little example of that i'm i'm the um i'm the chaplain of the legion in in summerland mm-hmm. and so of course remembrance uh, day is always my big day mm. and i was really surprised uh, this year because um usually i i give my little i i mc the whole thing and um i I offer a prayer at the end, and that's it, and everybody walks away, and we meet again next year. But this year I found um, a lot of people were were saying thank you. And uh, so I, I, I look back at the prayer that I'd written, and I found that um, it was not the traditional Legion chaplain's prayer, which focused on uh, veterans from the two world wars and so forth. Um, I had expanded it to include those who had recently served and had some of them um, PTSD and and trouble. So we, we remembered them in the prayer, and we talked about um, those who were now refugees and had been turned out of their home because of war and civilians caught up in conflict thought about those and obviously thought about people fighting in gaza and all the trouble was there and people in our own communities who who are refugees and I felt, felt I felt compelled to say at the end of each petition a very short phrase. We ask the simple question: How can we help them? How can we help? And and I think that that was significant for that prayer. That we expanded it from the obvious. And looked around and thought, well, what are the conflicts of today? And then, 
as with many prayers that I I write, I I, I put, how can we help? What can we do? Mm -hmm. it's, it's a place where we are doers as well as sayers. Mm. And and I think there are things that we can do for refugees and in our communities and so on. So prayer is motivating. Call yes, absolutely. You so. That's your book title, right? Called to act. It's not just yes, sitting exactly. there with our with our eyes closed. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Anyway, that's that's. This is a book of public prayers. This is a book of prayers where you are putting words into a congregation's mouth. What's the difference, do you think, between public prayers and private devotion? How do we do we pray differently? Is it a, does it have a different purpose or a different cadence or a different uh, way of thinking your way in? Yeah, we do. We 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 pray very differently. I um, the the thing is that with with public prayers, you you have um, you have to enter into the world of other people, and you have to think, well, what's going on with them, and how do you respond to their feelings with prayer? In your own prayer, you you have your own thoughts and your own words, sometimes usually unexpressed, and and you offer them in in a time that is um, of your choosing. Hmm. It, you, you don't have the, with, <laughs> one of the things that we don't do enough of, I think, in public praying is, is allow time for silence. Mm -hmm. And so it happens now and again, but, but not often enough. But in our own prayers, our own reflections, whatever you call it, then we have all the time we want. Mm -hmm. So, so there's, there's a place for that, and it's different. And the words, of course, that we we offer are uh, our own words. We understand perfectly what, what we're praying about. So, yeah, that's that's the the way. Okay. No, I that makes sense. I think that. It certainly resonates with me as a worship leader, right? I think the prayers I pray as a worship leader sound different, but I hope not too different. I hope they're also still authentic. Yeah. Well, you so how do you hope people are going to use this book then? Do you want them just to kind of take your words and, and plunk them into a worship service? What's your dream? Well, yeah, that's a really good question. Well, how will they use it? I mean, they can use it exactly as they want. We're coming into year B. Well, we are in year B now with um, with Advent. So there will be, um, and Advent has the gospel of Mark as a sort of primary gospel. So um, if you if you have a Mark passage, you can just go to the passage because the books in um, in chapter order, uh, you can find the passage and you can look at the prayer that fits the passage. You can say to yourself, well, is this the sort of prayer I could use in a service? Mm -hmm. And the yeah. answers to that are, um, yes, it's wonderful. Just what I want to say. Let's go for it. Mm -hmm. Or... You can say, let's change it around a bit and uh, a phrase here, a phrase there or several phrases and use it like that. Or you can say, I wouldn't use that prayer under any circumstances. <laughs> I would never tell you I was doing that, David. <laughs> but, but, <laughs> but, <laughs> but I've got a better prayer. And mm. I, I think I know what I can do. So it's a stimulus for people to do better as well. So there's that way. Then, I mean, if you're praying on a particular subject, um, 
you know, generosity, forgiveness, grief. Well, there's a good index. There's a very good index because I think the index model was won by Susan Lukey, who's one of our, um, our participants here. And um, so you go to the index and you look up what you're praying, what you're uh, preaching on, and you find some prayers. Hopefully that will fit with your subject. So there's that way. So... Those are those are the ways you can use it for the lectionary year, or um, you can, if you're leading a group of newcomers in Bible study. We talked about this earlier. You can um, you can go to the again go to the passage, find out what questions are there and what the introduction says about the passage, and use the book in that situation. Or if you're a committee chair and you have to give a devotional and uh, there's nothing in Off to a Good Start, another wonderful resource, then you could turn to this book, have a look at the, the subjects. If, you, if you're thinking of a subject to, to bring to the uh, group and, uh, and use, use the prayer there. So that's some of the ways anyway. Oh, and the other thing is... And I think a lot of people will be able to do this. It's to see the prayer as it is, which is responsive and responsive for a good reason. Um, and say, no, I obviously I just want it for myself, but I can change the prayer. I can write, rewrite the prayer, rethink the prayer so I can make it my prayer, not a prayer for lots of people. And I think that's also, you know, a, a function of the book that that you can use the prayer for your own private devotional if you choose. So you're inviting yeah. us to use this as a jumping-off point for all sorts of different ways, and we don't we know we're, we're not bound by copyright to use only your words. No, that's right, not at all. And that's um, a gracious permission. Anyway. Unless you're going to write a book, in which case, yeah, I need, <laughs> I need copyright. So we, we can't put it in a book where we're collecting royalties, but we could put it in a worship service bulletin. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Got it. That's, yeah. Uh, and that is a well, they, they say, they say, they say, give uh, due, um, you know, that that you have to say that it was by David Sparks, but I, I don't really fair. care whether you do or not. <laughs> yeah, but our publisher does, so I think we should. Yeah. <laughs> and speaking of our publisher, he's on the line. So let me let me invite Chris Chris Dumont to to come on the Dumas rather to come on the line and uh, uh, and join us in the conversation. Uh, Chris, I don't really think you're sitting beside the the lake there, but it's it's a lovely background. <laughs> Welcome. It, it, it's a lovely background, and and indeed, thank you so much, Stephen, for uh, leading us today, and uh, David for for your wonderful wonderful work. Uh, very much appreciated, and I've uh, it's been a tremendous joy working with you on this project. So thank you so very much. And, uh, uh, you know, additional thanks to Deanne Renault, who worked with you on the design, and uh, Kara James, who worked with you through uh, the editing. All those folks uh, supported you in this wonderful piece of work, David. So thank you. Actually, you've stolen my thunder. Because uh, I was going to thank <laughs> those apologies. three. My apologies. My apologies. No, no, accepted. But just yeah. so as you know, thank you yeah. personally, yeah. as you, you were a huge help as was Kara James, but but uh, thanks the whole group at uh, United Church Publishing House. They're a fantastic bunch, and uh, we're very lucky to have you serving the church. It takes and, a village to raise a child, right? Absolutely, absolutely. We have so many so many wonderful folks supporting uh, all this work. So it, it's, it's a wonderful team and a wonderful group of folks that are uh, that are behind this wonderful product that is this book called To Act. 
Um, I do know there is, uh, through our um, uh, United Church uh, bookstore, there is a uh, discount code uh, that is being offered to folks who are part of today's uh, or this evening's um, uh, participation. So I know that will be going out. I do not have the details on that, but I know that will be circulated out to folks. Uh, so just to let you know, there is a discount code that will be made available uh, for the uh, purchase of this uh, book that will be forthcoming. So I Great. will send, send that out tomorrow morning to everybody who registered for the program. And uh, it's it's good for a week and a half or two weeks, I think. So it's a time limited 15% off. Uh, and we'll send you send you a link to where you can find the book at the at the United Church Bookstore as well. Chris, can you answer this? Is it available in EPUB or is it only available in paper? How does this work? It is available as an EPUB as well. If you go to the UCRD store, you'll see it is a downloadable EPUB file. Um, and as we had spoken to before, there is the additional um, uh, Word document that can be uh, downloaded as a package with the EPUB that can then be used um, and cut and paste mode. Um, so David has been- oh, That's good. I didn't yeah. know that. That's really great. Yeah. That's that's wonderful. So so they don't. I've I've got a, a proof of it on my screen. But there's a word document that people can use to cut and paste into their church bulletins. That is correct. Yes. Fabulous. Yeah. We're coming close to the end of our hour together. We've we've actually hit one minute past the hour. So I I do need to draw this to a close. But let me open up the the floor just for questions or thoughts before we go. And again, please use the chat since there's 23 of us here. Uh, anything that David and I didn't talk about? Uh, any any other questions you have about prayer and why we do it, or what it's for, or David's book, or or uh, how to get your own book published, or any of that? It's uh, now's the time. You have 30 seconds. <laughs> And just while those comments come in, my thanks. My thanks to each of you, Chris and your team, for all of the work that went into putting this together. And David, what a, a delight to spend time talking together and to, to, to plumb the depths of this. And not just tonight, but the preparation that you and I have done for this as well. We were each saying that you know, you go into ministry because you love to talk about these things, and then you find you don't spend very much time talking with people about them. And what a privilege it is to to talk about these th things that are so close to my heart, and, and I know to yours too, uh, and to do it in ways that are deep and thoughtful and reflective and, and uh, tentative at the same time. That's important. Lisa, I don't have the link to purchase tonight. Um, the member of our team that we thought was coming uh, isn't here, and we're not sure why not, but we will get that link to you tomorrow morning. So I will send out the link uh, through Church X to everyone who registered for the program. We're going to close with one more hymn, uh, one more hymn, one more prayer. <laughs> oh, and no, I'm not singing. <laughs> there you go, David. Challenge. We didn't <laughs> practice that, did we? No, we're going to we're going to uh, we're going to pray out, and we're going to pray with the first hymn in the first prayer in the book, and then I'll go and get supper and kick my brain in gear again. So, David, tell us about this prayer and why are we using this? Well, it's the uh, it's one for this Sunday actually. It's uh, John the Baptist is doing the uh, is doing the prophet thing and. Uh, so uh, you may be preaching on it, or you may be using the uh, scripture 1 Mark 1 to 8. Um, if you are, this will sort of fit in. I think that's one of the reasons. And you can take the, uh, the words and, and enter in as you wish to them. Okay. I think... Somebody has annotated the screen by mistake, and I forgot to turn the annotation off. So let me just reshare that without the red lines on it. And, uh, and thank you for that, David. So as we go and as we prepare for Sunday, 
Invite us into prayer, David, and lead us. Yeah, through. let us pray. God said, I, I will send my messenger ahead to open the way. Loving God, we thank you for John the baptizer who prepared the way. A prophet who spoke heartfelt words. A prophet who caught the attention of ordinary folk. A prophet who called for radical change. A prophet who called for repentance. And a prophet who knew that Jesus was your chosen one. We thank you for his courage. We thank you for his straight talking. We thank you that he realized your call of Jesus. John got the ordinary folk of his time ready for change, for the way, the truth, and the life. Loving God, be sure, be very sure, we too are ready to follow the way of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. And so as we move towards the second Sunday of Advent, as we go and listen to these words and these stories from the prophet who spoke heartfelt words, may the blessings of Advent be with each of us. Thanks for joining us tonight. Amen. And Steve, thank you very much for setting it all up and, uh, and being such a good enabler. Absolutely. It's been great fun. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night.